I think we may have seen more floaters than ever this year. And it makes sense. It's such a good skill to have as the game develops. So we're going to look at floaters under the microscope through the lens of these three guys who are killing with it. So first let's dive into the win. One of the best scenarios to pull a floater out of that toolbox. Number one is dribbling straight at that set big man. Especially when you're at a slower speed and it'd be really tough to attack them with force. And it makes even more sense if that big is outside of that restricted area because they now have that advantage in a one-on-one -on -one finishing situation. So sometimes you just gotta get it off before you even engage that. Number two is having that defender on your hip, especially when there's help down low. And the good thing about this situation is that you can often create a bump, which instead of completely throwing you off your line, may create a good opportunity to float it up and even draw a foul. Or number three, if you find yourself moving across the lane, it's a great opportunity to put up a little floater and not having to worry about finding a tough angle to the bucket. And number four, especially in the league when coming off of that pick and roll with the option to dump it off to the roll man, that floater is great because the big is backing up and they won't have an idea if it's an oop or if it's a floater. And finally, especially at lower levels like high school and college, this is huge for attacking a closeout on the baseline and getting it off before that help steps over. So why is having a floater game so valuable? Number one, it's just so unpredictable. I genuinely believe we can pretty much always get one off, no matter the situation. So for one, floaters are inherently predictable because defenders typically expect a regular finish, but we can make them even more predictable with a few techniques. Number one is our eyes. If we lock in on that rim a few seconds prior to the floater, of course defenders are gonna be expecting it. But if we look away like here, that defender likely won't even account for the possibility of a floater most times. Number two is the orientation of our body. It's a bit easier to see a floater coming when we're dribbling straight at the rim. But when we shoot it moving slightly away from the bucket, it's tough to get a lead on that shot defensively. Finally, we can go with the off foot. Notice here how Trey goes off of that right foot with the right hand, which throws off that defender's timing since they're expecting one more step, and is honestly more comfortable for most players in this situation anyways. Number two, we can get into these easily at lower speeds. If we're attacking at a higher speed, it's a bit easier to get up and finish at the rim aggressively. But chances are we may not always be attacking the rim at top speeds. And sometimes we may be entering that paint with almost a walk or a jog. And for most, floaters are even easier at speeds like this, which presents a pretty good opportunity for us when we don't have the jets on entering the paint. Next is longevity. Most times in the NBA especially, that big is rotating over and ready to time that jump. Plus they're seven foot strong and typically pretty athletic. So having more options in your toolbox is huge so you're not jumping with that big every single time, creating contact, coming down hard, and at the end of the day putting yourself at risk. This is one reason why I think Jaw is going to have a good long career because he's young and athletic but also has the ability to pull back his aggression and shoot floaters more times than not. Or if you're just not very physically dominant like Luca and Trey, it's a great option to have so you don't have to attack that big man who's prepared and ready to time a contest. And over the course of a game, replacing five finishes where you jump as high as you can with floaters where it's a bit more chill can really save you some energy. And finally, it's a great way to draw fouls without much contact or risk. Since it's so unpredictable, so quick, you can shoot it from pretty much anywhere, so that floater is a great shot to get up as soon as you get a bump from that defender. Trey Young is especially good at this. He creates or feels that bump. In exaggeration or not, he bounces off in control and knocks in that floater. Now, keep in mind that floaters at the high school and college level will be pretty different most times from that pro level. So number one, most of these guys will shoot a floater and many times float forward with it. Chances are this is going to turn into a charge at lower levels where players are much more conscious of this. Also, you're likely not going to be initiating a floater from back here at the three-point line. Most drives in college and high school are off of two to three dribbles, so it's going to have to be quicker rather than these long, drawn-out two steps. And because of this, you'll likely be moving at higher speeds into that shot, which is something to consider while we're training. And finally, something important to note is that all of these guys have different styles of floaters. So, Luca fades a ton. Does he need to? Not necessarily, but it makes him feel more comfortable. 
jaw likes floating forward more and coming in at slower speeds. Whereas Trey will carry more speed into that floater and typically get those feet down quicker. Point being, there's no right or wrong way to do these. Different techniques will work for different players. And regardless of how you do it, they work. So get to work on them. Stay tuned on Instagram for a few ways you can lock in and work on these. Thanks for tuning in.